Welcome everyone to today's webinar, Mastering Orthopedic Tray Management and Compliance. I'm Lucas Voss and on behalf of Becker's Healthcare, thank you so much for joining us. Before we begin, just a couple of housekeeping items here. We will begin today's webinar with a presentation and we will have time at the end for an hour or so for question and answers. You can submit any questions you might have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. And if at any time you don't see your slides moving or you have trouble with the audio, try refreshing your browser, or you can also submit any technical questions into the Q&A box. We're certainly ready to help you out there. And to learn more about the content presented today, please check out the resources section on your webinar console and fill out the post webinar survey. And with that, I'm very pleased to welcome today's speaker, Dave DeGrossi, president of David DeGrossi Consulting LLC. With over 35 years of experience, Dave offers educational presentations, articles, consultative services, and Amy-based assessments to CSSOR and endoscopy professionals worldwide. Dave is also a medical device reprocessing subject matter expert for medical device manufacturers, medical companies, independent practices and surgical centers, and off-site sterile processing centers. Dave is an expert witness as well for legal matters within the profession and an expert in SPD design and renovation considerations for facilities. With that, Dave, thank you so much for being here. And um, I'll turn the floor over to you to begin today's presentation. Thank you, Lucas. Thanks for the great intro. And uh, thank you, Beckers, for having me. And thank you all for joining me. I um, appreciate it. Uh, very important subject. Uh, we're going to get into it today. And hopefully you'll have some great takeaways. You know, we always like to sort of present an issue and then give you almost like a little homework assignment or a little plan of action, a little guidance on how to navigate it. So um, you mentioned earlier, uh, 35 years of experience. I wanted to put another photo up there to convince you all that was not my high school photo. And uh, I have done sterile processing for the greater part of my life. So I like to say, it's not my job, it's what I do. I have a very strong passion for it. I am on a bunch of the Amy committees uh, as a voting member. And it's actually standards week this week. The Amy groups are meeting as we speak or as we meet. And um, I always wanna encourage you all to get involved, okay? There's a number of ways you can reach out if you're interested in that because who better to write and develop the standards and guidelines that you have to follow than you, the experts, okay? Out there, sterile processing. So with that, let's get into our subject today. Uh, we have some objectives. We are going to look at, uh, and I think you'll like the way that this is laid out today. We're going to look at um, what happens when we reconfigure instrument sets, whether they are sort of uh, hospital-made sets or sterile processing trays, and then what implications are there when they are OEM. You'll hear a lot of these terms and we'll describe what most of them are. OEM is original equipment manufacturer. You'll hear this term 510K. It's an FDA process. We'll get into that very shortly. But we wanna look at what, how do we do that? What, where's the guidance? And then what are some of the ramifications if we don't do this properly, okay? So again, let's uh, set some, uh, some little ground rules here, not rules, but some understanding of what we're talking about. And hopefully all of you know, when we talk about vendor or OEM trays, we're talking about loaner trays or consignment trays that are not owned by the hospital. They're brought in and out for the surgery or they live on our shelves, but we don't, we didn't physically pay for them or we don't own them. So uh, versus, uh, and here we go on this slide here, you'll see on the left-hand side, we're talking about SPD trays. And these trays are typically not validated. And the trays on the right, these OEM or loaner or vendor trays require validation uh, from the FDA. So uh, let's just say on the bottom left, this is a minor tray. You know, that's usually configured. It's See, there's a dance we do. There's a balance between the operating room and sterile processing. And we have to make sure when we're looking at these house-made trays that we are balancing the needs of the customer 
with science, okay? And that's really important because Amy currently, and you can see I put the Amy symbol there, our logo, because Amy provides us guidance. The manufacturer's IFUs provide us guidance. So we use all of that information and best practices to configure that kit there. If the OR wanted to add a really heavy mallet to that tray, we may have to put the brakes on it because the Amy guidance says the entire tray has to be 25 pounds, including the container or including the packaging system. So uh, the OR might say, you know, put all the retractors in one corner of the pan. So we have to balance that. We'll get into that a little bit on some of the further slides. On the right, you'll see what we refer to as the loaner trays or the OEM trays. These are cleared by the FDA. So the FDA uh, clears medical devices for the U.S. market. And when a manufacturer wants to sell products in the United States, they have to submit to the FDA for this clearance. Now, this clearance uh, covers both uh, class one, which is low risk, and class two, moderate risk devices, but it doesn't cover class three devices. So this is where the manufacturers have to do testing. They have to show cleanability, cleaning studies, and this is from a sterile processing perspective, the cleaning studies need to be done. And then more importantly, on the backside, um, sterilization, we had, they have to demonstrate and show that the device can be sterile and what were those cycle settings. So this 510K and the testing that's done around it is really where companies derive their instructions for use, the IFUs that we follow. So it's a very important process. It's very important that you make sure that any devices that you're uh, handling in the department, whether it's on the SPD side or on the vendor side, are FDA cleared, okay? That's a, one of the great takeaways of this. Uh, we get equipment from all over the world. You know, a lot of these companies are global companies. They have products in Europe. They have products in South America. Sometimes those sets might migrate into the United States, and, you know, uh, you want to make sure that you have that FDA clearance. Now, when we talk about standardization issues with these trays, like we said, uh, over on the SPD side, there is a lack of standardization. You know, we we configure the, my minor tray may not look anything like your minor tray. Now, some of the big instrument companies might have a generic list of what goes in a minor tray. And even within the world of, let's say, a minor or a basic tray, some facilities will start customizing within the minor tray they'll say dr so-and-so's tray which we all try to get away from we we try to have consistent standardized trays because we want 16 minor trays we don't want three trays for this doctor and three trays for that doctor so um, we also want consistency because when you manufacture and that's what we do in sterile processing we manufacture we put goods together. We want consistency. When we do a basic tray, we want to do a basic tray. We don't want five variations of that basic tray because I can get confused as a technician and make a mistake. Over on the vendor side, of course, everything is geared towards the surgery. Uh, we may have a laparoscopic tray over on the SPD side. We may we have customized trays just like the vendors do that target the surgery that's going to occur. Now, when these vendor trays um, are put together, they are cleared, as we mentioned earlier, by the FDA, and they have very specific sterilization parameters. Uh, we want to make sure that we are not breaching that, and that is at the core of what we're doing here today or what we're discussing. So if a medical tray, if one of these trays was cleared for the market and somebody just throws some X and I use that term, you throw extra instruments in there because they need them. You're kind of reconfiguring the tray where, where this tray was not cleared by the FDA with these instruments added into it, nor was it cleared if I took instruments out of the tray 
or if I left it the same and reconfigured the positioning of these trays, that's important as well, because we're not only dealing with sterilization, we're dealing with cleaning. So we want to make sure that um, these configurations remain intact. Documentation is always key, okay? Uh, we, we got a lot of wordy slides here, but I promise you there's some pictures coming up. And... Um, but there, there's a lot of important information here, and I wanted to do this sort of side-by-side -side comparison and not um, oversaturate the screen with images. But, uh, there, you know, there, we, we have to have documentation and inventory management. Uh, a lot of us, a majority of us, hopefully that changes, are on paper in sterile processing. We have count sheets. We have physical paper count sheets for our instrument trays. If we're lucky, somebody went and took pictures and printed them, and they're in a book. Uh, uh, maybe about 30%, 40% now of us have what we call tracking systems, which is a really bad term. We have compu robust computer systems that we put barcodes on these trays, and now we're able to pull up full images. We're able to get the IFUs. We're able to see the images. If things are take apart, we could take them apart. But we need to know. We need to track what's in these trays. Um, we need to make sure that if we give the operating room 52 components, that they 52 components are there after the surgery. So um, very important. And if something's missing, that's okay. If you're okay with your service leaders and it's not a non-critical set critical item, we could send things up missing, but we have to make a notation of that. Um, over on the vendor side, these trays are configured as such. They're specific. Uh, they're going to have uh, paperwork. You may not always ask for it and you may not always get it, but trust me, there are inventory sheets and you should be asking for the instructions for use to get your cleaning and your sterilization instructions that come with these trays. Now, some of us that have these tracking systems, they're sort of known loners and then there's the ones that come in you know you got to watch out for those ones that just come in there is a process in hospitals things have to be approved to come in we're sort of the gatekeepers in sterile processing but um you want to make sure you have the documentation including count sheets and the instructions for use and while you're at that while you're being that policeman at the door was the device were these trays even cleared to be used in the hospital, okay? So uh, important things there, but we wanna make sure that we have that because it's just as important. Some of these trays are loaded with more devices than any of our sterile processing trays and the OR has to keep an accurate count. We don't wanna leave devices behind inside patients, okay? That's the key there. Quality control, we have, um, we have to make sure that we have consistent trays like we talked about. Uh, we want to make sure that um, we're doing those quality checks, to, um, checking the uh, sharpness of instruments, the uh, functionality and cleanliness is really what's key. But when we're when it re in regards to configuring trays, Amy does give you guidance for that. Um, when you're looking at an instrument tray, for example, Amy gives us guidance and says that the tray shouldn't weigh more than 25 pounds with the container. So there's always a balance between the customer needs and I'll call what I'll call the science of what we do. So if the OR, if we're at 24 pounds with, let's say it's in a rigid container system, if it's at 24 and a half pounds and the OR wants to add this heavy mallet to the tray, we have to put the brakes on that. We have to say, no, we can't. We're going to exceed the 25 pound limit. That 25 pound limit is not just for ergonomics. It's scientific and it's based on um, not overloading a set with metal mass. We'll talk a little bit about that coming up, but there are reasons behind what we do. Even if we are within the 25 pounds of a tray, we don't want all that metal mass in one little corner. So we have to work with our customer to balance their needs and um, the science behind what we do. But when also they ask to add or delete items or add or take away instruments from a set, we shouldn't just take them or add them and say, okay, let's see what happens. Amy gives you guidance 
an SPD what to do with those trays. And um, it'll an example of that would be to, if you're adding instruments to the set or reconfiguring the set in SPD, you would autoclave it. And when it comes out of the autoclave, you can pop the lid and you would see if wetness is inside the tray. You don't just reconfigure a tray and hope for the best. Over here on the vendor side, these are typically tracked through barcodes and serial numbers. You might have seen some of my posts on this. Um, and this is on both sides, sterile processing and the vendor trays. Because we're moving to these tracking systems and, and label, and there's a lot of uh, Tyvek labels that are going on the trays, we have to maintain label maintenance, okay? Labels don't last forever. They wear down, they flake, they break off. We have to replace those labels. But for the most part, these trays are arranged in a certain manner and they have a certain count and they are no less, if not more important, than the SPD trays uh, that we we um, process. These these trays, when you're reconfiguring them, the tr uh, you want to make sure in either instance, if they were reconfigured or changed, we have to update those count sheets we're following because the old count sheet didn't show the mallet in there. So as a technician, I'm not going to. I'm not going to reprocess it within there. So we want to make sure that we get that quality control in there for doing this. That ties right into training and competency. If I'm new or I've been there, as long as I've been, a new tray comes along and I'm going to get trained on that. A lot of these trays are becoming more and more complex on both sides. But in the SPD world, we are going to get a sign off. We should have some documented training on how to put these trays together. It's it's either part of your orientation when you're new or it's part of your ongoing learning. Some of them are complex enough that we may have training and competency occurring multiple times a year on some of these complex sets, but it's very important. And again, it ties in if changes are made or things are reconfigured, things are added or deleted, we need to update the staff and that includes the third shift okay it's not just training for first and second shift if we're a 24 7 department we have to get to the weekend people we have to get the night shift same thing with the vendor trays here um if they change now when i say change i'm talking about from the vendor side of things um we if the vendor brought in new newer or updated trays or had trays that were different from what is in your system, again, you're going to need retraining. You know, a lot of us don't get the training in SPD. A lot of times the vendor comes in and they train the operating room, but they're not coming downstairs and showing SPD. Or if they do, again, they're coming in on day shift and it's sort of a train the trainer deal where they expect us to show the second and third shift. So, Get on that and make sure that they're training all of your staff. But if these trays change or they reconfigure them, um, you need to do the training and the uh, follow-up on it. So what are the challenges with doing this? We talked about some of them, but of course there's benefits. You know, you're, you're on the SPD side, you're meeting your customers' needs, but you don't want to get too customized. You don't want to get into those doctor trays and because you want to have 16 trays. You don't want to have three and for this doctor and three for this other doctor. Um, it's going to slow down your assembly. Uh, I mentioned weight limits and heat sinks. So you have to observe that 25 pound weight limit. And that also pertains to within the sets. Um, we could still be at 25 pounds, but if I put all those heavy Richardsons or a bunch of retractors in one corner of the pan, we also don't want to have a bunch of metal in one little corner of the pan because of various reasons. We could have wet packs. We could have the metal mass will stay hot for a very, very long time. Post-sterilization take longer to cool down. There's a science behind what we do. Okay, we'll say that again. Now, customizing these vendor trays, you know, these are validated trays. And I probably haven't said this yet in the presentation, but I know as a manager, I'm not touching these trays because they are validated as the way they were configured. That I don't own the trays. I can't add to them. I can't delete to them. 
we have to be careful, and I can't reconfigure them within the pan. We have to be careful if we someone says, well, the rep did it, the representative. Well, what is a representative? Some of these major companies have direct employees who work for the company, and a lot of them have, they work through what are called distributorships. They're independent companies that represent the OEM, the original manufacturer, okay? So it, it isn't good enough. For, uh, what I'm getting at is it isn't good enough for someone to say, oh, well, the rep did it. The rep reconfigured it. If these trays get reconfigured, we need the paperwork to go along with it. We need we need updated instructions and we need update, you know, they it, technically speaking, they need to be revalidated because they're validated the way they were sent to you. you. Earlier, I showed you that picture where instruments were thrown into the pan. Coming up, I'll have a live example of how I stopped the line when I saw this across the board with a whole bunch of vendor trays um, and what the results of that were. But these trays are owned and they are maintained by the companies and SPD should not be in the business of uh, reconfiguring them or adding or deleting items to the trays. So there, when we do this, when we change trays, there is a risk of human error, okay? There's human factors. You come in, uh, most of us in SPD know our trays, even some of the vendor trays. We know them. We do them so much we have it committed to memory, okay? That is very tricky. Do not do your trays based on memory. Do your trays based on the count sheets, okay? Uh, whether they're vendor or SPD trays. They have count sheets. We should be making sure that the components are there and, um, and it, that's part of what we do. We do um, functionality testing. We look for cleanliness, and then we arrange them into the order that they're supposed to be. And that should be consistent. Um, we want to make sure that um, all of the staffs, staffs, different shifts are trained, and that any, you know, anything that changes, it, it, things could have changed during your shift, let alone day to day change could have been made this morning and this afternoon you're doing the same tray you want to make sure you're using your count sheets whether it's paper based or computer based okay same thing over here on the vendor trays if if they do not match the original count there's not only uh sterile cleaning and sterilization issues but again we said this earlier we don't want to leave components inside of a patient it's the worst thing we can do do no harm, right? So communication. Uh, again, I think I covered that pretty well. We make changes to our sterile processing trays. We have to let the entire team know about it. Um, we um, and across our shifts, uh, including weekends. So we, same thing with these vendor trays. Um, we want to make sure that the teams are aware that the trays have changed you know, whether the entire trays were swapped out or whether it was a vendor approved change to the instrument trays. So, uh, we want to make sure that that's very well communicated. Costs and resource allocation. Okay, it does cost it does cost money on the sterile processing side, reconfiguring them. Like again, I said, we don't just add or delete or change things around and hope for the best. There is process, there is guidance for this. Uh, it, and there is cost to the instruments we're buying to put in these. Same thing on the vendor side. If they are trying to reconfigure a tray, who pays for that? We don't own these trays. So who does it? Who pays for it? What packaging system are they using? You know, today we are covering contents of the tray. Uh, the actual trays themselves and the contents within them. We're not really getting deep into the packaging systems, whether it's a container or a blue wrap, and for that matter, a peel pouch if it's a single item, right? So who pays for this? Who does it? Where's the new IFU, okay? And where is the paperwork? If they don't have an IFU and account sheet showing you that new configuration, they did it themselves. So... Um, they bear that responsibility. They own that. And if you don't want SPD to do it on their own, 
and it's not good enough that you say, well, the rep did it and he represents the company. No, you need paperwork, okay? They mentioned in the early, the beginning of this presentation or this webinar that I do legal cases and they are coming on more and more and more. And, um, you know, we're getting our names in the papers, whether it's good or for the bad. And when hospitals sue the patients, I always like to remind people that in this business of what we do, there are standards, there are guidelines, there are best practices. And then typical, you know, and very typical of the United States, there is the legal realm, okay? There are lawsuits. So you always want to balance everything you do within that mindset because you may do you may decide to do something, let's say, for example, with records, you know, archiving your records. Most hospitals will follow the state statute of limitations, meaning we don't destroy records for three years because after three years, you can't sue someone in this state. It has nothing to do with a standard. It has nothing to do with science. It's, it's, it's sort of in the legal realm, okay? So these are the things we want to balance when we look at these. Okay, let's talk about what an accessory to sterilization is. Any additional tool or product that's used during the sterilization process that references sterilization parameters. Um, why is this important? Because an accessory to sterilization could impact the sterilization efficacy. We want to make sure that it's not impeding steam penetration and steam sterilization, for example, or the wash spray if it's in a washer basket. So proper validation of these ensures that the sterile barriers uh, after sterilization also are not compromised. But So a quick down-to-earth example, the inner wire baskets of a rigid sterilization container, right? If there's no IFU just separately for that basket, the inner basket, if there's no sterilization parameters, then it's not considered an accessory to sterilization. And therefore, there's no 510K required for it. But example B can be an organizational tray within a rigid container system, um, such as these loaner trays that were cleared in a manner and in a way that they were configured that, uh, that you don't want to deviate from that. Uh, so there is an IFU for that. Uh, it may cover cleaning, it may, it, and it will also cover sterilization. So that would require a 510K. When you talk about the OEM trays, it's essential to use those, you know, that those accessory trays were cleared. Um, now, this leads to the example because real life examples are always the greatest thing to do. Um, I talked about this. Um, We'll get to the example, but uh, if you don't use these FDA clear devices, like I said earlier, on the legal side of things, there's liability for the hospital, but there's also accreditation. You don't want one of your accreditation bodies to come in and discover you're using uh, devices that weren't cleared by FDA. There's potential for failure. That's always the biggest thing in my book is do no harm. You know, we can harm patients. And... Um, we don't want to end up in the newspaper for the wrong ways, right? We talked about that, I think, multiple times. I think I beat the dead horse here with this uh, trays reconfigured, um, you know, can lead to liability. So we want to make sure that we do this. So what can we do as SPD? Make sure on the sterile processing side that you are definitely following the AMI standards, you're following your manufacturer's uh, guidelines. It's always good to do a risk assessment to say, you know, am I, are these trays configured properly? Do they meet the 25 pound rule? Um, am I doing the other section in ST79? Am I doing quality assurance? Am I, am I testing product categories annually? There's all guidance in the book for that. Um, if you're reconfiguring, if we're dealing with the um, with the third party, or I'm sorry, with the uh, vendor trays, um, 
you want to make sure that those reconfigurations were done. You can do that as a hospital. If you decide to reconfigure a vendor tray and you want to put it into a different basket, then you there is a pathway for that. It's fairly expensive, but it can be done. You use a third-party lab. You're essentially trying to get those FDA clearances uh, through a third-party lab, which nobody does. So that's where the burden lies on the vendor. You could request the company, you could request the OEM to reconfigure the tray, but typically these trays are configured as is for the entire United States. So uh, we really have to push on them to if these if we need these trays reconfigured or they are typically the ones wanting to reconfigure the tray because it's all based on the doctor's needs. Just like our trays are based on the doctor's needs, the service leader might come down and say, get rid of, you know, get rid of that pot scissor. We don't need it anymore. So we can do that. We can do that on our side. But on the vendor side, we can't. It's not as easy. We can't just be taking things and deleting them or adding them or reconfiguring them. You utilize a 510K uh, cleared organization tray. There are third-party companies out there that have this, that can look at existing vendor configurations and reconfigure them. I put a picture in here. If you look on the right, um, actually, if you look on the left, there are seven trays there. And then they were reconfigured as to what the doctor actually uses. And they were cleared and validated uh, in these trays that are good for both cleaning and sterilization. That is more of a, a um, proper way to um, make this happen. Uh, not the example that I'm going to show you now. I was in a hospital as I am in many hospitals, and a lot of the trays were just a hodgepodge, just things added, things deleted. On your left, you can see the tray it was just in one of the random uh, general instrument boxes, and I said there's no way that this tray here on the left was cleared by the FTA as such. And I think you would all agree with me just at a glance. So of course, I question the vendor. Now look on the right, there is an extras tray, I want you to just hold that memory. And I'm just going to share with you, I don't expect you to read this, but I want to show you, I wrote this big letter to the company. And over here on the left on bullet two, I said, about reconfigured trays, I said to them, the local reps can't place instruments inside these containers. And without FDA instructions, if you've reconfigured these trays, I essentially or this facility needs proper paperwork for it. I'm going to skip back because see this little box here on the left side, it might have implants in it. What if those implants in the tray that it actually belonged in, the IFU was 16 minutes or it was eight minutes for exposure time in steam? Now I've taken that and I've thrown it or added it to another set that the IFU says four minutes. So we have to be very, very careful. You're taking liability on your, there's a lot of complexities when you deal with these vendor trays. We can't allow either ourselves or the vendors, the local reps or the distributors in the field to just take instruments and throw them in the pan like this. So I reached out to the company made this, I told them about the 25 pound limit, cited some Amy stuff. Uh, I talked about product testing. So none of this was done. I presented it to the hospital. I said, you just didn't do any, you didn't even try not to, not that you can kind of do it on your own. But in the least, if you re, if you just slap this tray together, you didn't even do some basic product testing like we would with an SPD tray, let alone a 510K cleared device. So the company responded and it was actually pretty interested. Some of the issues were also uh, the powder coating, we, as we know, on these trays deteriorates, the actual trays themselves. So that was up there. But the reconfigured trays, the company said, we actually have an extras tray which is what I showed you here on the right. They have an extras tray, but the, the IFU for that extras tray 
does not say it says you have to have a single layer of instruments on that rubber mat, blue mat, and none of the instruments should be on top of or touching one another. So this was way off target. They were they I was actually surprised that the company had it has to be their instruments from a you know and it listed it in the IFU what system it was but they did some testing they did it the right way they took instruments out of that system and reconfigured them in this pan and did the product testing and had an IFU and had a 510k clearance for it so some of the summaries today we'll talk about um, we talked about the challenges of standardizing both sterile processing trays and these vendor trays. We talked about the documentation, the quality control, the training, the human error, communication, and that resource management. What are the protocols? Staff training, communication are essential. That's when we can do it. Many of the same things apply with the OEM trays, but in summary, what I'm trying to get across here is that you should avoid independently reconfiguring these FDA cleared trays or allowing either a local representative or a local distributor, if they do so, ask for the updated paperwork because typically they will not be able to provide that. But ask because... Um, Certainly, um, I was surprised to learn they had an accessory tray. And guess what? So was the local rep. He had no idea. So I educated their local rep, said, look, we could actually do this. You know, we can we can put it in the tray as the IFU instructs on a single layer without instruments touching. And we could have our cake and eat it. But uh, we covered all our bases. We covered cleaning. We covered sterilization. We covered liability. We, we hit all our target points. So doing all this, you know, always make sure, it, it always ensures that we have better surgeries and things are safer for everybody involved. Um, I would immediately, your takeaways, your, uh, are to do that assessment, go in there, okay, uh, tomorrow, today, if you'd like, go and look at your trays or when drop-off occurs with the OEMs, make sure you have a count sheet for each set. If you have four count sheets with five trays or four, you know, and four, I, or usually there's an IFU that covers the system, but make sure you have instructions and count sheets for each tray, okay? Because if you only have four and there's five trays, that might be a tray they just kind of put together. If you're doing a tray and there's extra instruments in there, you'll see, we all know there's typically not a slot for it. They put instruments in the corner or on top of things like the picture that I showed you. Um, something is, something's off there. Okay. We can't just uh, add, delete, or reconfigure. Follow those standards. Okay. Use the guidelines do your best practices, and then always have a legal consideration uh, for everything you do, okay? Call me or you can email me after this webinar and we can discuss reconfiguration solutions or if you need guidance, uh, I'm always out there and I'm always available to help folks uh, find the answers, okay? I may not, sometimes I'll give you the answer, but a lot of times I like you to find the answer for yourself so you can become independent. Uh, I want to thank everybody for your time once again, and I think we are going to have a little bit of time for some questions. Yes, Dave, thank you so much. That was so informative, so very interesting. I loved your line on uh, reconfigure and hope for the best. That's certainly not <laughs> what we want to do. We cannot do that. Absolutely not. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Yeah. Fingers, yeah, we don't want to do that. And we had a, a couple of questions uh, in the in the chat for you um, here. You mentioned the presentations that uh, there are certain solutions that are being used to reconfigure sets and that can help with that process. Can you talk a little bit about those solutions? And, and do you have an example for that? Sure. You know, I think I showed a, uh, I showed a picture of a company, uh, easy tracks is a system that's cleared and you know, that's, 
sterile processing, if you own the trays, you know, there are hospitals that purchase these systems and they own them. They're on our shelf and we own them. In that instance, you can certainly work with a company like that who has cleared devices and work on reconfiguring those trays. But again, when we go to that cost and allocation part, if I don't own the trays, then I'm going to push the vendor. I'm going to say, look, if we want to reconfigure these trays, we need to do it the correct way. Here's a company that you can work with. And um, there is a solution out there. Maybe the company, like we, like I showed you, may have a small accessory tray. They want to add a couple of screwdrivers to the kit. But you know, there is a big difference between what I showed you going from seven trays down to three, because these systems um, that the companies develop are pretty cookie cutter systems. Like I mentioned, it's for the entire country. As we all know in a sterile processing world, that doing surgery in a main hospital is certainly a lot different than an ASC or an ambulatory surgical center. We Our autoclaves are half the size. We're lucky if we have a washer and, um, you know, there's just not a lot of room and a lot of space in an ambulatory center. So when doctors and everyone just become naturally more efficient because of that. Um, if the doctor is using, it's it's called set utilization. You know, if, if you're using, if there's 10 trays, typically they're going to open, they're going to definitely open seven of them and then maybe really use three of them. Sometimes they're opening the entire set for that one instrument. And that's really what's driving the reconfiguration. Sometimes they want to back up, but sometimes if they put that screwdriver in the little accessory tray or in a basket, they don't have to open that other entire tray. So that's what's driving it. But we have to just make sure that we do it in an effective manner and in, and in a way that's uh, in a clear device, you know, with the proper IFUs and uh, cleaning instructions. Absolutely. One of the other questions that was connected to that um, that we got in as well, and you certainly, when you're in facilities, you're checking these, you're you're taking a look, you're seeing what everything looks like. But there are certainly other entities as well that do a, a, a surveyors that come in, they take a look, they see, okay, what are these trays looking like? Um, what have you experienced with set reconfiguration specifically when they happen as it pertains to those folks that are actually looking at them, the surveyors that are looking at the reconfiguration? How do they view the concept of reconfiguration yeah i mean they they treat it uh, essentially no differently than any other tray on our shelf they're going to look for the ifu they're going to look for the count sheet and if there's no matching count sheet or you've deviated from those configurations you could potentially have an accreditation problem so uh we want to make sure that we're doing this um accreditation is a big deal um I kind of like the fact that they're out there doing this because they're sort of our police force. You know, we develop and we write the guidelines. I'm out here doing audits independently, but I'm trying to prepare you for those folks that are coming through, but they really are our police. They are our folks on the, on the ground and making sure that these standards are being followed and uh, that we're not breaching or deviating away from these 510Ks. Absolutely. And I know you touched on this a little bit, and this is certainly important to what you've just mentioned in terms of making sure everybody knows where everything is, how everything is happening. Uh, how do I document set configuration? You had it in your presentation. Can you maybe outline just the key pieces that are really important for folks uh, when they do want to properly document that reconfiguration. Yeah, I mean, on the sterile processing side, you're going to want to follow that Amy guidance that I mentioned. And of course, we have count sheets. We wanna work with our service leaders because again, even if we stay, for example, like I mentioned, in within the 25 pound weight limit, we, we got to be aware of metal mass. We don't want all that weight being in one corner, for example. Um, then we want to do that education. We want to make sure we hit all points. If they are very complex trays, 
a lot of times we will have a competency, which would be, I'm going to train you, I'm going to show you, and then you got to demonstrate it back. Um, if that's the case on the vendor side of trays, uh, if something comes and they're reconfiguring it as the end, as the receiver of that tray, we want to make sure that we have an IFU and we could ask the vendor if they reconfigured that tray, did they do that in a cleared accessory tray that was uh, cleared by the FDA or, you know, think, think back to the picture I showed you. Did they just throw things in a basket or did they follow those proper channels to uh, with the reconfiguration or the adding or deleting of instruments? Speaking of those instruments, we also had a question here um, in the chat as well. Um, and they said that some manufacturers want us to remove the instruments from their inner trays and then ultrasonically clean every single instrument. In, in your experience, does that impact uh, the, recon the reconfiguration concept at all? You know, cleaning cleaning is really a whole other element. That is, uh, I think I have did a post on that recently on LinkedIn, but that a lot of these trays that are on the market are really designed with sterilization, intended for sterilization. When you look at their IFUs, it will tell you to take devices out and clean them outside of that configuration. But then on the assembly side, when we do our inspection, we're placing them back in those original holders. But um, that is sort of the next big thing there is uh, some hospitals have systems and there's some guidance out there that talks about segregating the the instruments that were actually used in a surgery. We treat everything that's used as being contaminated, but we have such large volumes that sometimes we will segregate or separate the actual items with gross soil on them. But uh, there's all kinds of guidance out there. But yes, to your core pr uh, point, they will give us those instructions. There are certain devices that are only able to be sonic and they don't want the rest of the set to be sonic when cleaning, but they all pair up. They do end up pairing up back on the assembly side. Some of the things I see, like I mentioned, uh, some of these trays are three levels high. So when we talk about cleaning, you know, I've, I've gone to facilities and seen those go through a mechanical washer three levels high. We have to separate these trays. We have to make sure that we follow the instructions and we're getting the maximum amount of spray wash on them. And then when you get over to the sterilization side, that's why some of these trays have their they're complex. They have extended exposure times potentially in the IFU because uh, Chuck Hughes used to say it's like taking a thermometer and putting it into the middle of the turkey. You have a, a dense, a big, dense um, mass of instrument trays that the steam has to get through all those layers and get to those devices and sterilize them. Now, they tested the tray that way. They know at four minutes we could achieve that. But if I start reconfiguring, if I put the top tray on the bottom and the bottom one on the top, or I add instruments, I could impede that sterilization. So there is science mixed in here along with ergonomics and user preferences. So we have to kind of converge all of that. And SPD is like the great leveler. Like we have to take all that information and kind of put it into context or literally put it into place, you know? Awesome. Dave, thank you so very much for all of your expertise, for all of your knowledge here today. Um, this is all the time we have. Again, thank you so much for your presentation and certainly innovative sterilization technologies for sponsoring today's webinar. And to learn more about the content presented today, please make sure to check out the resources section on your webinar console and fill out the post webinar survey. Again, thank you so much for joining us today and we hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, keep up the good work everyone.